Again, welcome to our February AstroQuest. My name is Kevin Kopchinski. Um, I run the planetarium and do STEM education here at the museums. Uh, joined tonight by Rich Sanderson, the president of the Springfield Stars Club, and Caitlin Goulet, member of the Springfield Stars Club. Uh, so we've got a, a nice program for you tonight. We'll start out with uh, with Rich uh, giving us some observations and, and um, of, of some of the things he's been up to, and then Caitlin will give us a review of things we can look for, um, and then we'll um, do a quick view of what's up in the night sky. And our main event tonight is going to be a trip to the moon. Uh, going to take a trip out to the moon and uh, visit around one of the craters and um, get a nice close up view. Let's get started. I'd like to introduce um, Rich Sanderson. Again, he's president of the local Springfield Stars Club. Uh, we are very glad at the museum to have the Stars Club um, partner with us in various events such as this. And um, Rich, before you get started with your pictures, maybe you want to tell folks a little bit about the club? Yeah, sure, um, Kevin. Uh um, yes, the Stars Club is, is a, an amateur astronomy club that's been um, meeting at the museum uh, for many years. It was actually founded way back in 1934, so it's been around for quite a while. And um, it's it's a, a club where anybody who loves astronomy or science or space exploration can get together uh, with other uh, like-minded people and enjoy programs and and um, discussions and just have a great time. Uh, we we have speakers every month, either on Zoom or at the museum. And we also help out the Science Museum. We, we've uh, partnered with the museum on many programs over the years, and we we uh, join forces every month for Stars Over Springfield on the first Friday of the month, um, which is a a great program for the public in the evening where. There's a, a presentation in the Tolman Auditorium, a trip to the planetarium, and, and a chance to look through the giant rooftop telescope that the Stars Club uh, built back in the 1970s. Um, it's been used since, uh, I believe, 1972 for public education. And um, you can see the, the silver dome here in the parking lot. And on the first Friday, you can go inside there and see the telescope. I should also say that um, Caitlin, who's with us tonight, Caitlin Goulet, is uh, a member of the club, and she's also now a, a member of the board of directors. Um, she, she's the youngest person in the history of the Stars Club to be on our board of directors. So congratulations, Caitlin. Uh, great to have you on the board. And, uh, and the, you know, there's a lot of really interesting people who are really passionate and enthusiastic about science and astronomy, and, and it's a it's a fun club. I mean, you can there, there is a membership dues if you want to become a permanent member, but anybody is invited to join our meetings for a while and see if it's something you want to do. Um, I'll mention the, uh, a few of the upcoming events. Um, our meeting at the, um, will be a week from tonight, um, Tuesday, February 22nd. Um, we had returned to the museum following the pandemic when it was easing up a little bit, but because of the spike after Christmas, we did our January and we will do our February meetings on Zoom. So next week's meeting on the 22nd at seven o'clock will be on Zoom. Um, the person speaking will be Dr. David Wexler, who's an MD. Um, he's a, a very knowledgeable astronomer. He's uh, gonna speak, he specializes in the sun and solar research and he's gonna speak about close encounters touching the corona with the Parker Solar Probe. And the corona being the not coronavirus, but the thin atmosphere that surrounds the sun. The word corona means crown. And so the atmosphere of the sun is like a crown that you see during a total eclipse. And that's what the Parker Solar Probe is investigating the outer uh, super hot atmosphere of the sun. So that will be a week from tonight, February 22nd at seven o'clock. If you would like to attend that and you're not on our club, email list, um, you can send me an email at my email address is rhs31416 at yahoo.com. Again, rhs31416 at yahoo.com. 
and just say you'd like to be included on the mailing list and you'll get a link for that meeting a week from tonight. The next event uh, will be Friday, May 4th, and that's um, the Stars Over Springfield event that we do jointly with the museum. And that'll be a, a live event at the museum um, beginning at 7.30. Stars Over Springfield starts a half hour later than, than a lot of other programs. It starts at 7.30. At the March 4th program, uh, one of our club members, Ed Fates, is going to speak. About, um, the title of his, his lecture will be Starlight, Star Bright, How Astronomers Gain Information About the Universe by Studying Starlight. It's almost miraculous how much you can learn about stars just by analyzing the light that we see, uh, little pinpoints in the sky using spectroscopes and different equipment. And that will be what he talks about uh, you know, a beginner's level talk um, on the March 4th SOS at 7.30 at the museum. Next um, month's Stars Club meeting will be on Tuesday, March 22nd, again, the fourth Tuesday at seven o'clock. And every once in a while we do sort of like uh, member uh, participation type programs. And for that program uh, next month on March 22nd, Jack Magus, one of our longtime members and a planetarium lecturer at the museum, planetarium educator uh, for many years, um, is gonna lead a, a discussion um, among club members and anyone that wants to participate where we're all gonna talk about our favorite astronomy stories from over the years and how we got into astronomy. And I'm sure there'll be people uh, talking about seeing bright comets and tremendous meteor showers and total eclipses of the sun and different things like that first hand accounts so that should be pretty interesting if you want to uh, kind of an informal meeting where anybody that wants to participate can do so so those are the upcoming programs we have meetings through may um both sos and and club meetings and um if you join the club uh, we have a facebook page where we announce these meetings and you can also receive an email but as I said, you're welcome to uh, stop in at a few meetings and see if, if it's something you want to do. And um, we'd be glad to have you. Now, Kevin, um, you can start with my pictures if you'd like. But when you observe during the winter, one thing you, you must keep in mind if you're gonna bring a telescope outside to look uh, through at the night sky, even if you go back indoors, bring, bring the telescope out maybe an hour or so before you want to start observing because everything in the telescope, the, the lenses, the concave mirror, the housing, everything has to reach the outdoor temperature and it contracts as it does that. Um, things expand in heat and contract in, in cold temperatures. And, and as the telescope is contracting and the optics, even if it's uh, millionths of an inch, that's enough to uh, distort the lenses and give you a blurry image until the telescope cools off. So a lot of times, you know, you set it up and you look through it and say, you know, what's wrong with my scope? How come everything's blurry? And then you re remember, oh, we got to let it cool off some more. And once it reaches the outdoor temperature, then everything clears up nicely. So in the winter, bring it outdoors and go back in and enjoy dinner and watch the news or whatever, and then go back out later. And when the telescope is ice cold, that's when you want to use it. And that's what I did on February 9th. Over the years, I've really enjoyed observing and photographing our nearest neighbor in space, the moon, which is a quarter of a million miles away, <clears throat> beginning way back in the 1960s when I got my first little TASCO telescope and I watched the total lunar eclipse of Good Friday, 1968. I've just loved looking at the moon and, and the geology of the moon, mountain peaks and craters and everything. And and so this month, um, I took a pictures on a couple of evenings. Um, you can see the date, February 9th. Um, so that wasn't too long ago. First, a uh, little beyond first quarter moon. And if you jump to the next one, I've labeled some of the, um, it should be the same image with some of the crater, um, Mare, there we go, uh, labeled. What you're seeing is the, the surface of a world that has no atmosphere, no running water, no wind, no erosion of any kind. Uh, erosion does take place because little tiny uh, meteorites, microscopic meteorites rain down on the moon and, and also larger ones hit the moon once in a while, but that's a very, very slow process. And so 
when you look at the lunar surface, you're looking at a surface that's millions, in some cases, billions of years old. It's a very, very old surface. And during those billions of years, there have been a lot of chance encounters with asteroids and chunks of rock floating in space called meteoroids and micrometeoroids. And, and that's what makes all those little round things that you see, the craters all over the moon. Those were made by meteorite impacts, um, in some cases, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of years ago, because the erosion on the moon is so gradual, we can still see them today. Some of the very oldest craters have had other meteorites land near them or on top of them. So little by little, they get destroyed, but it takes a long, long time. There's nothing on the earth uh, anywhere near as old as the moon's surface, although we do have meteorite craters on the earth, but our atmosphere protects us from a lot of them, but the moon has no atmosphere. So every little tiny pebble and grain of sand from outer space crashes into the moon and makes a little crater or in some cases a bigger one. In the upper middle part, um, I've labeled the Apennine Mountains. Um, that's one of my favorite features on the moon. You're looking at a beautiful mountain range and you're looking down at it as if you're in a spaceship or an airplane looking down at a mountain range on the earth. You've got a bird's eye view of the Apennine Mountains. And, and it's, it shows up very beautifully in this picture because it's on the Terminator, which is where the sun is rising on the moon. It's where the light part of the moon meets the dark as if the moon was cut in half. And right along that line, um, you can see that everything shows up really well. Everything has shadows being cast across the moon. And those shadows make these features stand out. And so people that enjoy looking at the moon zoom in on the Terminator, and that's where you can see the most detail in either photos or, or visually through your telescope. Now, the moon is in a captured orbit. As it goes around our planet Earth about once a month, it also rotates at the same rate. So we always see more or less the same side of the moon. We never see the back of the moon, although it does wobble a little bit. We, we see the same face of the moon all the time. It's called a captured orbit. So there's a, a portion of the moon that we never see unless, unless we become astronauts. We're ne never gonna see that. But as the moon goes around our planet once a month, we, we see it from different angles and different portions of the moon are illuminated. So, so when the moon is between the earth and the sun, the part of the moon facing the sun will be lit up and the part that we see is dark and that's a new moon where you don't really see it, it's black um, because the sun is hitting the backside of the moon. But then as the moon continues in its orbit around the earth, uh, a week later, you'll see the moon like we do in this picture, first quarter, where we're looking at a side view of the moon where the sun is, is illuminating the right part and the, and the left part is in darkness. And then a week later, we see a full moon where the, the earth is between the moon and the sun. And we're seeing the entire hemisphere of the moon that's lit up by the sun. So as the moon goes around the, the earth, it, it appears in different crescent and gibbous phases. And every night it looks different. And every night that terminator is in a different place. So Night after night, you can see different features highlighted by the, the terminator of the moon. It's just a, it's a fabulous thing to look at on, on 100 power, maybe 150 power, where you can zoom in on these mountains and craters. And, and you can see the, the sunlight changing in a matter of a half hour, an hour. Even though the moon is orbiting so gradually, you can see the, the sunlight wash across the bottom of a crater, or sometimes you see a mountain peak bathed in sunlight where the base of the mountain is, is in darkness so you see like a, a pinpoint uh, right on the terminator and that's that's what causes that so um, we see some of the lava plains the uh, grayish areas where impacts cause lava to flow across the surface and obviously a, a newer surface because they're not heavily cratered still millions of years old many millions of years old but newer than the highlands at the bottom portion of the moon which is wall-to-wall -wall craters and and um the light area, that's, that's the lunar highlands. The darker areas are the newer areas, which are lava plains that are made up of sand and dust. And there are craters there, but not as many as on the rest of the moon. And, and they were given names relating to bodies of water because early astronomers, when they looked up at the moon with the naked eye before the telescope, they thought they were seeing oceans and lakes on the moon. 
which is what they would look like to the naked eye. And so you have Sea of Serenity and Sea of Crises and the Sea of Tranquility, which of course is famous as, as the landing site of the, the first human beings to walk on the moon, um, Apollo 11, which I've also marked with a red arrow. Next picture. <clears throat> hey, Rich, so we've got a couple of questions. Um, are there any recent craters on the moon or are they all from uh, long ago? Yeah, you know, the large craters are from long ago. I don't, I don't know of any craters that you could see in a backyard telescope um, that are recent. Um, but tiny craters are made from time to time, and and especially um, when the Earth sweeps through a, um, a cloud of comet mm -hmm. debris, and we have a meteor shower when the debris comes through the Earth's atmosphere and burns up, we see falling stars. But that debris is also hitting the Moon. And it's so small, we wouldn't see it hitting the moon. But what what um, stargazers do is they take video. Uh, they do a video recording of the moon on nights like that. And on the dark half of the moon, every so often, somebody records a little tiny flash of light that only lasts for a fraction of a second, which is a little pebble hitting the moon and vaporizing and giving off a flash of light. So, so there are a little tiny pebbles and, and grains hitting the moon more often, but no, no large craters have, have been made um, any time recently. Okay. Um, and then one other question, um, are you using a moon filter? And if so, what kind? No, I, I, I've i never really used a moon filter. And the moon is, is pretty bright, but it's not going to hurt your eyes. Um, it just seems bright because your eyes are dark adapted. But I, I took this um, picture through a small telescope with my camera attached where I took the eyepiece out and I just slid the camera in with a special attachment where the camera could go into the eyepiece opening and um, just a regular digital camera. And by you know doing a, a short enough exposure, this was probably like one 250th of a second, you know, pretty quick exposure at ISO 100. You know, you get a decent picture like this and then you can tweak it a little bit afterwards and and improve the contrast, but um, there are there are moon filters. You know, if you're studying the moon visually for a long period of time and it hurts your eyes, you can get a filter that dims it a little bit. But I, I've never used one, and none of my pictures are are using any any kind of filter at all. Just straight pictures of the moon. Okay, the next um, picture is Whoops. taken uh, through my six inch refractor, which is a much bigger scope than I used for the previous one. This telescope takes a while to set up. So when it's cold out, your hands freeze uh, handling all the metal parts on it because you can't really do it with gloves. But it, it allows you to zoom in really close uh, to the moon. And, and this is that Apennine mountain range that I said was so cool in that previous picture. I'm zoomed in on it here. Uh, the left just shows the way it looked through my scope and the right I've labeled uh, Mare Imbrium and some of the mountains at the top, Mount Pico and Piton. Uh, you can see the shadows cast behind them and actually measure their heights by the length of the shadows and and different craters, Archimedes. You, you see that craters are named after astronomers and scientists and astronauts from the past. Um, and in this picture um, near the Apennine mountain range, we see the Apollo 15 landing site um, where they, after a few landings, they, they got bold enough to land uh, near a mountain range uh, in, a, in a more geologically interesting part of the moon. And that's uh, shown in yellow, and the Caucasus Mountains uh, to the um, to the uh, upper part of the uh, Apennines. It's sort of a continuation where lava flowed through and kind of cut cut the range in half right there. But the, if you like geology, it's just really so cool to look at the moon and look at that um, the Alpine Valley on the top, uh, like a, a little cut right across the lunar surface. So. Was um, oh actually uh, the next one is sort of a, a, a an even closer zoom. I just yeah just uh, show that one for a moment. That's even closer just to show those mountains and that's you know that that's how uh, a mountain range on the Earth might look from the International Space Station. You know if you're going over the Himalayas or the Alps or something. Uh, only we're looking at a world a quarter of a million miles away. Now this was taken a few nights later on February 12th, which was Saturday night. And I, I've showed you different ways of taking pictures. The first one was with a, 
digital camera and a small telescope. The, the uh, close-up of the Apennine mountain range was with a digital camera and a bigger telescope um, on a real massive mountain. This picture was taken through a smaller size scope using a, a handheld iPhone, believe it or not. Um, holding it up to the eyepiece, zoom in a little bit, tap on the moon, darken the exposure because it tends to overexpose when you use an iPhone. And it takes a little while, the, the hand-eye coordination, but after a while, your hands, eyes learn how to do it in the dark and, and you're able to get the pictures. And I, I um, was at a stargazing program that I'll show you some pictures of and, and in the parking lot of Walmart in Westfield and people were looking at the moon and in between people I just put my phone up to the IP and, and, and clicked a picture of it and it came out pretty good just for a, a quickie picture and um, in the next uh, the next frame is the same picture with again some some craters and some objects um, labeled Tycho at the bottom portion of the moon there Looks like the belly button of the moon. That's, um, it's millions of years old, but it's one of the newer craters on the moon. Um, it's a nice fresh crater. And when that impact took place, it scattered dust and debris around the moon. And you see the rays extending from it in all directions. During a full moon, those rays show up really nice, but they're beginning to show up in this gibbous phase um, Saturday night. So that's something that you can see with a small telescope when there's a full moon you see Tycho like a little white spot in the southern highlands of the moon and you see those rays like the spokes of a wheel and then Copernicus is another large famous crater named after the great Polish astronomer Nicholas Copernicus and then further up Plato which is a, a dark crater and, and that you can see the um, mountain ranges the sea of showers uh, there's some really really cool features on the moon that are just a lot of fun to look at and you know even though people have walked on the moon maybe it lost a little bit of its mystery but but there are still things to learn about the moon water deposits and ice here and there not liquid water but frozen water and uh, and um, rovers up there now being sent by China and other comp uh, countries sending back new pictures of the moon's surface so uh, it's still an exciting world and and, and it's a good target for a beginner with a backyard telescope. Now the next couple of pictures show the, the uh, stargazing program to just show you some of the activities that happen in the local area. And this is a, a club that um, Caitlin, who, who's gonna be speaking next, Caitlin Goulet um, founded at, at her school, the Westfield Middle School. And this is called the Westfield Middle School Space and Astronomy Club. And as you can see, a few members, quite a few members in the bottom picture, those are all members of the club that came down to Walmart to set up telescopes. And I brought my telescope down and, and Caitlin and her dad brought their reflector down there and we gave pe people uh, a high power and a low power view of the moon. We had probably a couple of hundred people look through the eyepiece. Uh, we were all, also, uh, Caitlin was collecting donations toward a, a telescope that's going to be um, given to the library at the Westfield Middle School. So it was a really fun night for a worthy cause. And I think the most rewarding thing about these stargazing programs, and I've been involved in hundreds of them over the years, letting people look through my telescope. And, and the most rewarding thing is when somebody comes up to you, even a, a, an adult, sometimes a, an elderly person, who says this was my first time ever looking through a telescope or the first time I've ever seen a, the moon's crater live or the rings of Saturn or something like that. And it almost chokes you up that you, you have the, the privilege and the, and the honor of introducing somebody to their neighborhood in space and giving them their first look through a telescope. And I heard that several times Saturday night. So um, that was my reward for the, the evening was having that spoken a few times. The next picture shows a few more views of that, and that's my last. And as you can see, it was it got pretty cold just standing around manipulating all that stuff with bare hands. But it was, uh, you know, we were there for a couple of hours, and people coming and going came over, and they were especially eager to have their children look through a telescope because that's kind of a rare opportunity. So um, people took advantage of it, and as you can see, uh, a lot of happy people. Uh, getting uh, their first glimpses of the moon close up. And that's, that's it for, for my report. Okay, thanks, Rich.
Uh, thanks very much. It looks like a fun event there, um, even though it was probably cold. <laughs> uh, good. Um, very nice. So um, next up, we, we have Caitlin. Caitlin, in addition to what you've um, already heard, uh, writes a newsletter. Um, she is coming up on the second anniversary of that newsletter. And uh, you can subscribe by sending an email to starryscoop at gmail.com to, uh, to learn more. So tonight she's going to be showing us the uh, things that you might find around the constellation uh, Perseus. So, um, Caitlin, go ahead, take it away. So as Kevin mentioned, I do write a monthly newsletter called The Starry Scoop. It's coming up on its two-year anniversary in just a few months. You can find me on Facebook, and as you mentioned, um, you can email me at starryscoop at gmail.com. So this is my last month's edition, February's edition, um, and it com it's comprised of several different sections. It has a What's Up column, a current and historical um, recap of upcoming events. Um, we have also a little calendar and a star map for the readers. I have a What's Up section, a retelling of my own or observation observation section, excuse me, a retelling of my own and other people's I've interviewed observations. And I also have an object of the month, a fun little challenge for the observers who read this. So tonight we'll be ex we will be exploring the constellation Perseus. Perseus is one of 80 official constellations in the skies. Now, I like to think of constellations as puzzle pieces. They each take up a specific amount of um, a specific space in the sky and they all fit together perfectly to create the entire celestial sphere. Now, observers and astronomers recognize these constellations with their bright stars creating star patterns or asterisms. Um, the constellation Perseus, I like to think of it as a tin man. It has its tin hat and then two legs and its body. So some stars to see in this constellation. Um, we have Murfak and Al Gul. Murfak is the brightest star in Perseus. It is a super giant star and it's at its later, later stages in life. Um, it has a confirmed exoplanet around it, um, which is just a planet orbiting somewhere um, outside of our solar system. And it's about eight times the sun's mass and has expanding to, expanded up to about 60 times that of the sun. Um, now we also have Algol. Um, Algol is the second brightest star in Perseus, and it's a very well-known eclipsing binary star. It's actually the first eclipsing binary star ever discovered. Um, eclipsing binary stars are when two or more stars orbit each other, and one goes in front of the other, causing the light to fluctuate. Now, these fluctua fluctuations can last anywhere from hours to days to weeks to months. Now, I also, on the star map here, I circled some double stars for a telescope, and double stars are just some of my favorite objects to observe. With the unaided eye, they appear as a single point of light, w but with a telescope for these objects and some with binoculars, two or more stars can be revealed. And now the, some of these stars just have beautiful color contrast with white to red. They're just amazing. Now we have some binocular objects. We start off with the famous double cluster or NGC 884. The double cluster has been known since prehistoric times. It consists of two clusters um, and they're, half a, uh, they're each a ha about a half a degree in diameter. Um, they're perfect in wide field eyepieces or even binoculars. They're about 7,000 light years away and are only a few hundred light years apart from one another. And they're actually both quite young. Uh, one is about 5.6 million years old and the other is 3.2 million years old. Now, that might seem like a long time, but in retrospect to the entire like universe, it's a, it, they're quite young. <laughs> um, we also have the Alpha Persei group, which is an open cluster around Murfak. It actually um, shares the same um, proper motion with Murfak. That's right here, then double clusters right up here. Um, now, the Alpha Persei group is visible to the eye the die. It's about three degrees in diameter. And it consists of about 100 young blue-white stars. And just with binoculars, they're amazing to see in the double cluster. Another beautiful object to see in binoculars is M33. It's an open cluster. It's made of about 400 stars. It's easily visible with binoculars. And um, it's visible with the unaided eye under dark conditions, so away from city lights and light pollution. Um, I would just like to point out this beautiful image I have um, taken by Tim Conley of the double cluster. You can see the two clusters here. 
We also have some deep sky treasures. These objects will require um, a little bit more to see. Um, they're a bit fainter. Uh, I would recommend a telescope. Um, we start off with NGC 1499, the California Nebula, which is right here on the map. Um, it is a large faint emission nebula, which um, emission nebulas emit their own light that resembles the state of California. Um, we also have M67, or 76, excuse me, the Little Dumbbell Nebula, which is right up here. Um, the Little Dumbbell Nebula is one of only four planetary nebulas in the Messier catalog. Um, planetary nebulas are when a star blows off its outer layers when it reaches the end of its life, and those layers expand to form the planetary nebula. Uh, most planetary nebulas are small but bright. We also have NGC 1023, which is a galaxy uh, right over here. Um, and this um, is a bit fainter and it will require a medium telescope. Um, and our final, our final object we have here is NGC 1333, a reflection nebula, um, which uh, reflection nebulas require um, to, for, for us to be able to see them to reflect light from nearby stars. Um, and now this object is associated or is part of is part of a molecular cloud or gas region in Perseus, which is an active star forming region, region that contains hundreds of stars, um, which are already formed or in the process of being formed. And right here, I would just like to point out another photo by Tim Conway of the California Nebula. I would like to thank you for watching. Clear skies, remember to keep looking up. Okay, uh, thank you, Caitlin, very much. Again, this is the time of year that if you can stand it, the view outside is beautiful, and you get out there and look at um, look up into the sky, and if you don't have a telescope, at least look for some of the uh, brighter things that you don't need a telescope for, and it's, it's just marvelous to look at that sky. It's got such a um, beautiful aspect because of all the bright stars that are in a lot of these constellations that show at this time of year. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and take a peek at the sky for a bit and see what's up there. Um, we're using the program called Stellarium. Uh, Stellarium is available for any computer. It is a free program. And it is pretty much a simulated planetarium. You can use that to see, you can set the uh, time and date. It's a little small down here in the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can set the time and date. You can set the, um, lo your location to where you are and get a look at what you can see out there in the sky. So as you can tell from the nice red W at the bottom of the screen, we're looking to the west. Um, which is, that's a, that's a nice feature. You don't have that in the real sky. Uh, <laughs> the, the letters to help you know which way you're looking, it, it, it is a help. And this is set for a time that's about an hour and 15 minutes after the time of sunset. And that's where it starts to get pretty much dark enough to see, um, to see lots of stars. And so toward the west, uh, very low in the west, we have the great square of Pegasus is uh, now sort of approaching the western horizon. Above Pegasus is the constellation Andromeda. Over to the right of Andromeda is Andromeda's mom, uh, Cassiopeia. And then the constellation that Caitlin was telling us about uh, is Perseus. And you see them all together in the sky. And in fact, this is more or less a family portrait, um, so to speak. Um, Perse uh, Perseus rescued Andromeda from some great danger. They ended up getting uh, married. And uh, so Cassiopeia there is, is in fact, his mother-in-law. Um, I believe this star right here. Yes, that is, there is Algol. Um, so it is, in Perseus, it is the star that's sort of on the arm or leg that is closer to Andromeda and Pegasus. And you can see that um, it, it's very, con there, you can find uh, charts for that just about uh, in, in a lot of places. If you look for the minima of Algol, 
Um, those two stars circle each other. The dimmer star comes round every couple of days, roughly, and it it takes about three to four hours to pass in front of the bright one, and so it just goes dim uh, for for that amount of time every couple of days. And as Caitlin mentioned, it was the first one noticed because this is uh, it is a note it, it's a easily seen star. And the change is very drastic over those few hours. So this was known, this, this star was known throughout antiquity. And, um, you know, one thing about that is when, the, when the, the stars and the heavens were something that were thought to be something that was unchangeable. And for something like this to happen, a star that just goes dim and gets bright again, that, that was unsettling. Um, to people. And so uh, one nickname for Algol is the demon star. And in the Greek legends, Perseus, as you might remember, is, is the warrior who slew the Medusa with the head of snakes. And the Algol is representing the Medusa's head. Um, and, and indeed a demon star at that. So that, those are some things in the western sky uh, and to the northwest as well, we should say. Um, moving to the south, we're beginning to see our winter friends come to the southern sky. Oh, there's Orion, and above Orion, Taurus, and above Taurus, the Pleiades star cluster. Down below Orion, you have his hunting dog, Canis Major. Uh, the, the great dog, and then up above to the left, Canis Minor, um, the uh, small dog or, or the uh, little dog. And then up there we go, we got the moon over there to the east, and Gemini, the twin, the stars of Castor and Pollux. Castor and Pollux are twins. The stars, no, they're not twins at all. Uh, they're very different from each other. And then finally coming around to the east, there is the moon, and that little bit of glare from that display might be um, sort of uh, from the display of the moon might be washing out. It is right in front of Leo the lion. And so this round part represents the head. Down there is the chest. In the back is not quite showing at the fall of darkness. His entire back end doesn't quite show yet. There's three stars back there for the back end and the tail. Uh, and at, at the fall of darkness right now, not quite clearing, uh, not quite clearing the horizon. So those are the things that you can uh, look for in the evening sky. Um, our next astro quest is in uh, in. March, on March 15th, and if we look at what changes by then, we'll get up the date, we'll switch, oh, that changes. Um, in between now in our next AstroQuest, the clocks change, so we're going to have to um, move forward a little bit, and even compensating for that hour, the seasons are changing. It's getting late. The sun goes down later, so we'll have to compensate a little bit more. I have to go past 8 o'clock at night to get it dark enough. And by next month, well, the almost full moon is going to visit Leo again. And there is the back end of Leo now clearing the horizon. And if we move back to the um, west, uh, at this point now, Pegasus and, and Andromeda are pretty much down below the horizon. I think some of this is the last remnants of Andromeda. There's Cassiopeia and then uh, Perseus um, right next to there. And then we see coming, there's Orion, there's Taurus, Cletus. They're all coming towards the west um, in, uh, by, as we get to March, showing us again the progression uh, of the seasons. So we'll come back, and you might be asking, wait a minute, what about any planets? Well, right now, the planets are pretty much a morning thing. We have to go to the eastern sky, and we'll have to get to the morning hours. Uh, there we go, about 5 o'clock in the morning, we begin to see Venus. And if we progress it a little bit more, by 5.30, Mars is up just underneath of it. 
And uh, for today, th that mid-month, that's going to be pretty much about it towards the east and southeastern sky a little bit before sunrise. As we make our way to the end of the month, first of all, sunrise is getting earlier. And toward the end of the month, we have a crescent moon visiting the scene. Uh, might be worth in it up for 545. That's not too bad. And Venus, anyway, is going to be bright enough to see ahead of that sunrise. Mars, maybe, maybe not so. As we uh, continue down there on the horizon, can you see it as we get into early, as we get into the early month of March, Saturn is coming into the uh, morning sky as well. And we had a brief pass of Mercury, but this was one of Mercury's not great appearances. It really hugged the horizon the whole time. Probably very hard to see. And honestly, Saturn probably not going to be too easy to see until later, later in March. So anyway, there's a, there is a, a look for us at um, some of the things that we can see in um, the night sky. Uh, so oh, in the chat, uh, thanks, Greg. 0.21.3, the latest version. So notice they're still in version zero. <laughs> they, uh, it, it's still a, it, it's very much a work in progress. Uh, this is uh, this is something that's just done by a few people. I, I believe over in Russia, uh, or or if not Russia, one of the Eastern European countries, and some other folks, basically from Europe, uh, and, and uh, it, it's just a wonderful thing. So um, you know, su basically support them, let people know about this. Uh, it's it's a fantastic resource, and it's it's what I'll use to kind of familiarize myself. And get myself ready to do a planetarium presentation, so I know what's what's going on. Going to show you a site here. This site is the NASA's Scientific Visualization Studio, and this is where they post a view of the moon as it appears um, at on that time and date. So there's. Where can you? There it is. You can set the time and date up above. Now you notice I set it for time zero. This is universal time, Greenwich Mean Time. We are five hours behind that. So um, if you, so this is essentially set for seven tonight, but in in universal time that is actually it's it's, it's midnight. Um, so actually this is actually seven o'clock yesterday because it's midnight on the 15th. So let's change that to the 16th for, for tonight. Yeah, oh yeah, so it changed a little bit. You notice that it kind of tilted a little bit. Um, Rich alluded to this, I think, in his, uh, in his presentation, that we see actually a little more than that half a moon because the orbit of the moon is sometimes above us, sometimes below and we see around the top, the bottom, or the sides a little bit. It's called libration. And this uh, visualization studio also shows you libration so that you can see where maybe you can peek around the edge. I believe um, what I read in Astronomy Magazine was that right, that uh, this month and next month also around the full moon we can see down along the southern horizon a little further than uh, than usual thanks to libration but uh, I just wanted to also just give you uh, this that overview we're going to head over to this bright crater here um, Aristarchus which was still in shadow uh, a few days ago when Rich was taking his pictures but we're, uh, we're going to see it, and of course, we're going to use a tool that can get us there and have us look at it um, just about any time. And then the other site that I want to look at, this is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Quick Site, and, or Quick Map. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is an incredibly high-definition camera that is orbiting the moons and just taking pictures. And so they've stitched together all those pictures into... Uh, in, into this view here. Uh, so this is a great way to look at the uh, moon if you don't have a chance to get a telescope or if it's cold, maybe. Uh, 
and so the thing with this, with the with the quick map, is you can zoom in. Now, the one thing about the quick map is you're sort of stuck with this, with with our view, so to speak, the view from Earth. And so where we're going to go, for example, tonight is sort of a little getting towards the edge, so we kind of see it oblong, so to speak, or a little bit um, edge on, but we're going to get a better view of that using another tool in a minute. Uh, so you anyway, that this is a great way to... Um, to explore things. And then over here where it says layers, you can do nomenclature and you can get all kinds of labels of stuff. Uh, so you can see what's what up there as well. So you can maybe match up to, if you're looking at the moon, um, you can match up to what you're seeing on here and, um, and see what it is or what it, what it is that you're looking at. There we go. So now we are using a program called Open Space. Open Space is also a free program, and it is for any computer in the sense that you can. It will work on Windows or Macintosh, and I believe Linux. That may take a little doing, um, but I believe that is possible. Uh, however, it's not quite for any computer in the sense that you need a computer with a really strong graphic system to, uh, to use this. And a, a pretty good amount of memory and processing because what this is doing here on the moon, this program, put, it's taking all that data, for example, from the Lunar um, Reconnaissance Orbiter and others. It, it is displaying that data in real time for us. You know, chain, we, now we can change our orbit and it is feeding us new data as we change our view. Now, if you do this enough, some of that data gets stored on your computer. So it, it does help to also have a decent um, uh, internet connection um, to use this. But it, it, uh, it's amassing lots of data from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and others. So let's go in and we'll move up a little bit to where, so we're going to look at a crater called Aristarchus. And Aristarchus is also a crater. Now somebody's asking about ages, right? So Aristarchus is one of the younger craters on the moon, but when we're talking this, we're talking still it's, estimated at 450 million years old. The, basically, the, it's thought that not too soon after the Earth formed, something smashed in, something the size of Mars smashed in, and the, in the aftermath of that uh, material was ejected and formed the moon. Then there was a period of what was called the heavy, uh, late heavy bombardment somewhere about 4 billion years ago. Now, after that collision, the moon was really hot. It had an active core of magma, and those collisions happening during that time were, first of all, were fairly large objects. So um, these maria are large basins where there was an impact and the impact actually punctured the uh, magma layer, so to speak, and flooded the area with magma and flattened it out. Um, after that, the impacts slowed down and there weren't as many big things, so there's not too many objects on uh, or impacts on these maria compared to the highlands, which never got flooded so the, this is, this is a very, very old terrain, you know, going back maybe about those 4 billion years or so. The, this crater that we're going to visit, Aristarchus, this is a fairly young crater, 450 million years <laughs> young, but it is young. And as, as you can see with some of these other ones, with these, the rays that come around it, the deeper material of the moon is lighter in color, so a large impact that smashes in is going to um, kick up that bright material. Let's go in and have a look. So unlike the uh, quick map, we can really get in on this. And as we get in, 
what will happen is the program is going um, to shift us from maybe some of the lower resolution imagery to the higher resolution imagery that came from uh, both mostly the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, but some others. And now let's see, we'll start adjusting our view a little bit so we can set down. It's a combination of using the mouse and using the control key sometimes and remembering when to put the control key down and when not to. <laughs> so here we are. So here we are settled, uh, setting in and setting down. And there is that crater out in the distance um, of Aristarchus. So we're, we're looking, again, somewhere around 450 million years old. It is um, about 25 miles wide and about one and a little over one and a half miles deep. And a large crater, a large impact is going to smash the moon down, so to speak, but then, and, and the material kind of comes up the side, but then the material kind of settles back down again. And when it does that, in a large impact, it'll pop up a central peak in the middle. Um, so here we go. We're, going, we're getting over the rim of the crater here. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll go in. Now, you can actually, as you can see, maybe we're a little too close <laughs> Uh, to it, it's so it, it's really hard to resist the temptation. Kevin, uh, the, yes. the question was: Is this the same program that you used to take us to Mars in a previous? Yes, program? yes, it is. Yes. So it um, this program does the same for Mars as for the Moon. Mars and the Moon are probably the most impressive things because the cameras that we have out at those places are just phenomenal. Um, with the close-up camera that they have, you can image something the size of a laptop. Now, you, but it's in a very small area. You only see a small area. So we can see up here on this rim that as the as the edges of the crater settle down, you get this sort of terracing effect that occurs. On uh, and, and this again is for large craters. Now. Next to Aristarchus, Aristarchus, by the way, um, as Rich mentioned, you know, they're named after uh, astronomers and so on. Aristarchus was a, a Greek astronomer. He lived in roughly the third century BCE, um, and he was at least the first recorded person to, uh, to assert that the, the Earth goes around the sun. He didn't maybe have a whole lot of strong observational evidence for that. And sort of the commonplace, uh, you know, sensation that, that the sun seems to be going around us sort of won the day. So uh, it, it wasn't until later. Interestingly enough, if you look at almost any foundational science belief or 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 and and more than belief that we now have really good observations and evidence for you can probably find some ancient greek scientist who thought it who who thought that that was true um and, and so he's one of them and right next to this right next to aristarchus we have the crater of uh herodotus i believe something like that and so this is a very good comparison. Now, one thing might be, which crater is older? And I'm going to view out a little bit, and if you want to throw an answer in the chat, go ahead. And and there, there's a pretty good giveaway here about which crater is older. Um, as we mentioned, the, the uh, Aristarchus came in, or the impactor came in, and threw out a lot of bright material, and looked at the bright material is covering over this crater. So this is an older crater. I've, I've not found a good estimate of the age of this crater, but it's got to be older than, than Aristarchus. Um, and, and then this whole area, this whole area is... Uh, from these two craters and up there towards the northwest, I think, is the direction. This is called the Aristarchus Plateau, which was the site of a large upwelling, apparently, um, and this would have been before the impact 
Okay, this would be before the impact of Aristarchus. Um, there was a large upwelling of magma, and some of that erupted and flowed out across the surface. And so just up over here, we have the Vallis Schroederi, which is the largest um, rill or rima on the moon, where some of these, these ones that kind of wiggle and meander, these are probably lava flows. And this whole Aristarchus area has a large concentration of these things. This one's the biggest. Um, it ranges from about three to 10 miles in width uh, overall and goes on for, I think this is even a couple of hundred miles, maybe a little less, maybe it's less than a hundred, but for, it goes on for quite a distance. And, and so th this, whole, this whole area had a lot of this sort of volcanism, sort of like a, on Hawaii where, you know, it kind of fountains up and spews and it spewed a lot of dark material over. But then again, we can tell that Aristarchus came in later and deposited bright material on top of it. Let's take a good look at that because now there's something really interesting about this particular rill. Um, as we get closer, there was actually another lava flow inside of it. And it's not known I'm, or maybe it's not able to be determined if this was a second flow that came later or whether maybe this, this flow took a long time and this is little one is sort of the tail end of it, maybe even uh, you know, thousands of years later that, that went inside. If we can kind of come around and um, you can see that inner flow going right down. Sometimes it's down the middle, sometimes it's over toward the edge of the larger flow. So um, there we go. There's a, a nice, again, as you know, Rich is saying, this is our nearest neighbor in space. This is a thing that we have some of the best looks at. We can get out there with telescopes and we don't get quite a view like this, but uh, you know, you get a pretty good view of things. Uh, and um, you, you can look for some of these features if you're, as Rich said, if you're into geology. So there we go. That, that's, our, that's, our, that's our trip. And so we're, we'll uh, wrap it up here. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. And we'll look forward to seeing everyone uh, again on, on March 15th. And uh, until then, uh, safe uh, have a safe time, have a fun si time uh, observing, and um, and thanks very much for coming by. Good night. And, and thanks to Rich and Caitlin, as usual, for uh, helping out and making this program uh, really special.